Hi everybody, my name is Richard Anderson Martinez. I'm the Director of Intercultural Student Engagement. Um, I'm here today um, with Angela Schambarger who will introduce herself shortly. Um, we will be doing a one hour overview of the Green Dot Training Program. I think this works, yes. Um, and I also believe we may have some folks on the Biddeford campus too and so um, if you're over there and you're watching us, welcome. And I, we have a, another colleague who's assisting us, who's also a Green Dot instructor, and her name is Carolyn Tate. So if you're in Biddeford in the DeCary function rooms, Carolyn is a staff person who's there with you because this is an interactive training. And so we'll ask you to interact with one another and, and respond to some of our questions. And Carolyn will be there in Biddeford to help facilitate those portions. Um, again, my name is Angela Schambarger, and I am the Title IX coordinator for the University of New England, which means I'm responsible for education, prevention, response, and policy, and compliance around issues of gender, anti-gender discrimination, um, sexual assault response, policies and procedures around those issues. And one of the things that falls under the umbrella of my work under prevention is bystander intervention strategies and one of the things that the university took on a couple years ago and became committed to is a green dot bystander strategy and we're here today to talk about that program which is a national program which we've adopted as an institution how it works here how it impacts individuals and how US students understanding these techniques and these programs whether you do the full training or not can take that into your world once you leave the institution into your clinics into your workplace into your personal lives so it's a pretty um, robust program and we're really excited and feeling privileged to share that with you today. Um, one of the things to note is I will refer back to my notes a lot. It's not because I don't know what I'm talking about. It's probably because I know too much about what I'm talking about. Usually when I do these trainings they're five hours. And so this way I don't over talk about certain issues and I stay on track and I don't talk about Richard's content. And um, when we talk about why this, um, what the assessment tells us about this program, it also says we have to follow it with fidelity. So there are certain things I have to say in a certain way. So if you see me referring to my notes to make sure I do it correctly. So please be patient with me. And we're low tech, so I may come over to press a keyboard periodically as well. Um, so that being said. We're also going to talk about some things that may be unsettling or uncomfortable for folks. We're going to talk about power-based personal violence, which covers rape, sexual assault, dating, and domestic violence. And that may touch us in ways we don't anticipate. And I want people to practice self-care. So if something triggers you in a way you didn't expect, please feel free to leave, get up, go to the bathroom, go get a drink. Come see me afterwards, come see Richard afterwards. But I also wanted to call attention to our website, which is une.edu slash um, title-9 reporting. You'll find all kinds of resources, both on campus, including UNE Counseling Services, on the Portland campus, and Barton is actually a victim advocate, which is a wonderful resource for our students. And the Biddeford campus also has several trained folks, and that's a confidential resource. But also, I have, towards the bottom, a lot of off-campus supports for both campuses, both Portland and Biddeford. So I just want to refer folks to that. So if you're overwhelmed, you want someone to talk to, you don't feel like you can do that now, um, go to our website. There's tons of resources there as well. A little bit about Green Dot, it's a national program and it's a bystander strategy. It's a prevention program addressing sexual assault, domestic violence and stalking. And it's designed to equip students or individuals to recognize the warning signs, develop intervention options, and proactively change norms. And it's a first step in a long process around pre prevention at, in a community. Um, when we made the decision to choose Green Dot, was that you? Okay, Richard, scoop my clicker, thank you. Um, we made the decision to go with Green Dot because of all the prevention strategies that are out there, it was actually demonstrating through assessment that it actually made a difference. And I'll talk a little bit more about statistics in a minute. But what they're seeing when it's implemented in high schools is that there's a 50% reduction in violence at colleges and universities that practice it with fidelity, 17% reduction. And it's also been adapted for the Air Force and there are also municipalities like Anchorage, Alaska and other um, towns and cities that have started to implement it there as well and they're seeing some changes in their strategy. Okay. Um, it has several training objectives, primarily to provide tools and support for prevention efforts. It's active and interactive, and it provides training with students for, um, with experience. And part of this today is to do the overview of the Green Dot program. Thank you. It has four phases. We're per currently at the university in phase two. 
Phase one was we got a bunch of faculty and staff trained on how to be instructors. Richard got a training. I went to Kentucky and got a training. Um, and then we started doing this past year a full out on bystander training for our students, faculty and staff. We've trained over 100 students on both campuses this year. That's pretty freaking exciting for me because a lot of them are student leaders, students who took it back to their communities and I have a wait list of students who want to do it. It's a five and a half hour training so it's no small commitment, but it's a pretty empowering experience and students have been talking about it. Phase three is also where we're starting to embark. We're doing presentations such as this one to make people aware of the program and the techniques engaged. And then that we partner that with several action events. We'll talk about those as well. All right. Actually, if we could minimize this and go to a website I have. Sorry. You'll get to see my pretty pictures in just a minute. I use video a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Team versus team. That's as good as it gets. Oh, oh man. I've never had more fun my whole life. Uh -oh. <laughs> Daddy's out of beer. I'm gonna go to another one. Hey. Yeah. Is your card? No. Lamorne, stop doing magic. You're not good at it. <laughs> Guys! Oh! Dude! There's a bear in your other room here. What? Oh, that's just a big, angry, hungry bear. Just pretend it's not there. Oh, really? Yeah. And it'll just go away? What are you talking about? No, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I don't know what to do about it, so I just ignore it. So it's not, it's like, it's not dangerous, right? Define dangerous. It's a bear. <laughs> but, you know, it's not going to eat all of us. It only eats, like, one in five. So. Oh, 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 I said only one in five, so we're fine. That's a lot, man. That means one of us is going to be eaten. Statistically. And that doesn't mean one of us. It means one in five people getting eaten. Yeah. Yeah. Something about this man. Hey, what do you want me to do about it? You guys know the old saying, bears will be bears. That's not a saying. Lamorne, a bear will be a bear. So you can't just blame the bear, not when it's attacking 20% of the people who come here. 20%? <laughs> I said one in five. Yes, that's 20%. And no, it isn't. It's one in five, you math nerd. Let's pile on this guy. Dude, you gotta get rid of this thing. Or at least warn us that there is a bear in the other room, man. We gotta look out for each other. What are you doing? Hey, what happens between you guys and the bear is none of my business. Wait, how is this none of your business, man? One in five people are gonna get attacked by this bear! Ah, ah, you're overreacting. The bear is not gonna eat all of us. It, it'll be less than a quarter of us. None of us should die. And it affects us all, Jake. One in five. How can you ignore something so important? How can I protect your friends? One in five, one in five. Ah! So that's kind of a fun way to poke, um, shine a light on some of the statistics that we've seen consistently over the past several years. Um, one in five women will be raped in a college campus. They're saying one in 10 men potentially would think that number might be larger because there's a lot of barriers to reporting for men. And we're just starting to go, oops. Pay no attention to the background noise. We're just starting to understand how rape and sexual assault is impacting the LGBT community as well. Um, you can go ahead and flip the next one. Look at those people. I have been working at the University of New England since 1998. I've been professionally engaged in higher education since 1995. I'm showing my age. But throughout the whole of that experience, I have worked with students. I've worked with communities to try and change a culture of violence on our campus, doing prevention efforts. I've been heavily engaged in um, gender studies, gender curriculum, working to end um, those statistics in college campuses and you know when I started and I was getting ready to go to college the numbers they were giving me were one in five so in 30 years 25 30 years those numbers haven't changed but you know what I know I've worked really hard I know my colleagues like Richard have worked really hard and other colleagues across colleges universities and communities have worked really hard to try and educate individuals and communities about how to be safer how not to rape how, what does rape look like how not to be a rapist but those numbers don't change and over those 20 years, I worked with students, I heard their stories, I had to talk to parents and explain why this happened to their son and daughter. The stories are heartbreaking, um, but I kept working at it and I, kept, I was committed to the cause because I knew there had to be a way to make a change. 
I felt my work had purpose to make change in my community. And then in my late 20s, I had babies. And I looked at those chubby little brown little faces and their big brown eyes and I realized that my work had imperative because what we know about power-based personal violence is that it impacts all of us. Those are my sons in the upper left corner, that's Benjamin and Jeffrey. When Benjamin was 10, I had to spend an hour explaining to him what sexual harassment was and why three members of his cross-country team were suspended for it because of how they touched, harassed girls on his team. He was 10, not quite 11. When my older son was 14, his first couple months of high school, I had to talk to him and comfort him and help him understand how he could be a support to one of his best friends who was a female who was sexually assaulted by her boyfriend. She was 14. I have pictures of students I've worked with, and through the Green Dot program, what they do is they um, sometimes share their personal connection, like I am today with you, um, about why they're committed to this issue, and their stories are heartbreaking. They are committed. It has touched their lives in so many ways. It's touched your lives in ways that we probably will never understand or know about. I have nieces, nephews, friends. It touches all of us, both in our academic communities and in the outside communities. So once I started to understand that my work no longer has purpose, it is an imperative to make change in our community. And all the work I'm doing with students, and I'm sitting there hearing their stories, talking to them about what happened to them, what the next steps are, how can we connect to the resources, is there a conduct process, do the police need to get involved? When I'm talking to witnesses, 90, over 90% 90 of the cases that I'm working with Somebody else could have gotten involved somewhere along that continuum that maybe their actions could have stopped that bad thing from happening. Maybe they saw bruises, maybe they noticed a big change in behavior, maybe they could have said, you've had too much to drink, let's go home, or hey, she's had too much to drink, get her phone number, call her tomorrow. But when I talk to those people and those individuals and I ask them, well, what, if you knew this, why didn't you do something? They're like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say, I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't think it was my job. So it really was very clear to me that we needed to make this a community issue. Um, it's a public health issue. We need to figure out as communities what our responsibility is, what we're seeing, and then how do we give ourselves tools to know what to do? And I came across the Green Dot program um, at some other training that I did, and I was really impressed when I did the training. And I have to say that every time I do a training, every time I work with students, I am filled with hope about the tools and the way they leave that program and the changes that they're going to make in their communities. So, yeah, so, we'll there. Um, so given the scope of the pro problem in college across the, the country, we really need to look at this from a culture change perspective. When I say culture change, I know that can feel really big. Like, what does that mean that's really hard to understand? Um, to be one person, to think that I'm just one person, how can I make a difference? But what we do know is that culture changes happen around us all the time. Things happen. The situation changes, our environment changes. In some ways, that are very superficial, like the type of music that's popular, the way people dress, how people think about smoking, women's rights gay rights, all those things have changed dramatically in our lifetime. Um, the question isn't, can we create a culture change across college campuses and in our communities? It's how can we create those changes? And what's our role in making that change? Oops, sorry. Does anyone know who that guy is? Who's that guy? It's Mark Zuckerberg. He created this thing called Facebook. Everyone heard of Facebook? Anyone not have a Facebook account at some point in their lives? One, do you have any other kind of social media? So you're connected in some way socially online, okay? Facebook was the first, all right? Right now, at the last quarter, 1.79 billion monthly users on Facebook. The next closest, I think, is Instagram with 400 million. So it's still really the banner. Um, for Facebook, I remember a time before Facebook existed, all right? And then they had it in college campuses and we had big meetings in the administration about what we were gonna do when Facebook came to UNE and how it was gonna change everything and we were very scared. Now we all use it all the time. But it was a big deal. And this guy, Mark Zuckerberg, sitting in his dorm room in Harvard, 
tried to figure out what he was going to do on a Friday night. So he said, I'm going to find a way to hang out with my friends without having to leave because I don't want to leave my room. So he created this thing called Facebook and he typed in his email, created a password, created an account, first Facebook account. Was that when culture changed? No, it's some guy doing something in his room and not socializing really with other people. But then he went down the hall and talked to his friends, 10 or 10, 10, 20 of his friends, and said, hey, I just made this really cool thing, and it's a way we can all hang out without having to see each other. So he, he told them how to do it, gave them the website, and they all went, put their email address in, created an account, created a password, and in two minutes, they all had a Facebook account. Is that when culture changed? No, not really. A bunch of folks, kids at Harvard, hanging out finding a new way to hang out with each other. But then those 10 or 20 people told 10 or 20 of their friends who all went, put in their email, created a password, and created Facebook accounts, who then, and then it launched from Harvard to other colleges and universities, then it got into high schools, and now everybody uses it, like grandma has it, mom has it. We all have our own Facebook accounts that we share with our friends and the one we share with mom and grandma. Um, so it's all over the world. Has the culture changed around social media and how we talk to each other in the past 10 years because of this? Absolutely. Now, I don't know which account was the actual one that was the tipping point that created the cascade, a point of no return for us, but I know that it happened. And it wasn't one person doing a huge thing. It was millions of people taking two minutes to put in an email, create a password, and create a Facebook account. So the point is, it wasn't one person who did one big thing. It was lots of little people doing little things that actually made change. And so when we think about our campus culture or our community culture, it's the same sort of thing. I'm going to turn. All right, my turn. Um, so thank you, Angela, for sharing why you're interested in this topic um, and why it's important to you. Um, there's two beautiful women behind me. Um, the one on the left is my grandma. Um, we call her Grandma Cupcake. Um, and she is wearing her beach girl uh, costume at her, um, at her former employer's Halloween costume party, right? Um, it's not a shower cap. It's just one of those little saran things you put over a bowl, right? Creativity <laughs> runs in my family. Now, Grandma Cupcake um, is up here because she spent um, the majority of her adult life in a marriage that she couldn't escape. Um, she was married to my grandfather, who was physically abusive, who was sexually abusive, and Grandma Cupcake, right? Uh, she grew up in a time where it was legal to rape someone within a marriage, right? Our laws have changed, um, but only in the last 20 years to remove something like that, right? Um, She's one of my heroes, she's one of my like role models, she means a lot to me, right? But I do this so that other people don't have to go through lives like that, so that people have a life of choice, right? Um, and on the right side is my goddaughter, Kennedy. Um, the picture's a couple years old now, but she's my second youngest niece. Um, I come from a large family, so I have 11 nieces and nephews. Um, and it matters to me that all of them um, know about these things, that we're talking about them even when they're young. Um, my oldest nephew just graduated college, right? And I also have a niece who is four, right? So like there's a big range there. Um, but there's a range of lifetime and experience on the screen behind me too. And it's important to me um, that nobody has to go through these things, right? We can stop sexual assault, right? I know that sounds crazy because we know that it's so pervasive and so rampant, but there are more people who don't commit sexual assault than who do, right? Okay. Ding. All right. So if you've ever watched um, any type of TV movie, um, you know, Outbreak, uh, The Walking Dead, um, something that involves other zombies, right? Um, at some point, you know, you have this sort of patient zero, right? There's this one dot and eventually like it spreads and it covers the whole map, right? That's kind of what's going on here. Um, so it starts with a few dots um, and it multiplies, right? So here it looks like maybe there's some sort of infection on the coast making its way towards quaint, peachy Omaha, Nebraska, right? Um, or somewhere in the middle. Um, has everyone seen an image like this? 
Quick raise of hands, right? Cool. All right, so just like Facebook, that image shows how a lot of single cases add up to something bigger, right? So each one of those, um, we could say, is either someone with a disease, or it's someone creating a Facebook account, right? Or some other social media, right? Eventually, those individual things all add up. All right, so um, this is a map of Bitterford, right? So imagine that it's a map of Portland, right? Um, Imagine a map of our campus, right? Um, one red dot, right? Any of those, right? Um, is not a disease, is not a Facebook account, but is in fact someone's single choice to make, a choice that someone has made to use his or her words or actions to hurt someone else, right? Now, we say hurt, but that can mean a lot of different things. Within the context of our training today, or our discussion, um, that's sexual assault, partner violence, or stalking, okay? So, one of those red dots is a moment that it takes to hit someone, right? Another one of those red dots is forcing sexual or physical contact, either through hazing, some sort of initiation, right? Um, another one of those red dots could be forcing someone to have sex with you without consent. Um, another one is taking four to five minutes um, to use your words to humiliate someone, to threaten someone, to coerce someone, right? To get them to do things that they don't normally want to do. Um, and they're the small choices that, we all, that people make um, when they show up unwanted outside of someone's work, outside of their classroom, right? When they meet them at their car in their parking lot, the parking lot, right? Um, what are other potential red dots, quote unquote, right, um, related to sexual assault, stalking, partner violence that you've seen or that you can think of? If you raise your hand, someone will come over with a microphone. I'm just looking for a couple quick examples. What do you think um, could be one of these dots on the map, right? Like persistent calling or texting? Absolutely. What else, right? Something that we all know in our gut just like isn't cool, right? This doesn't have to be super difficult. I know you just ate pasta and you're a little sleepy, but I know you got this, all right? Um, give me another example. What about, um, how would you know that somebody is committing sexual assault on campus or that they plan to? What are some signals? Okay, we'll tell you, right? We'll get to that. Um, so again, a single red dot is just a small decision, right? We make thousands of decisions all day long. Um, just like to open a Facebook account, right? Except with very different moral implications, um, right? And just like Facebook, enough of those red dots have added up to create a culture, right? So just as Facebook has changed our culture, right? Even in the last I really think it's been like 10 years. I remember being in high school and Facebook was this like new thing that you could get when you went to college, right? And now like, again, everyone has it. Um, but this culture has changed so much. And if we're talking about this same context, the culture that we have on university and college campuses is one that allows for unacceptable rates of these power-based personal violence, right? Um, it's a lot of words, but that's the, that's the phrase we're gonna use today to talk about all three of these types of violence together, all right? Thank you, all right? Now, imagine a single green dot in the middle of all those red dots, right? Look at them go. Those are all people doing something to stop a red dot, right? Um, so uh, we call these reactive green dots, okay? Um, this is pretty easy, right? Red dots are bad, green dots are good, right? Green dot is the name of the whole program. Hopefully you're following along, okay? So a reactive green dot is a single choice that someone makes to use their words or behaviors to make it less likely for the red dots to get up on the map in the first place, okay? So a green dot does not have to be a big thing. It can be very small. It can be someone's choice to check on a friend or a classmate that they're worried about. Right? You can say things like, hey, I've been worried about you since you've been in this new relationship. I just want you to know that I'm here for you. Right? Um, that's pretty easy. That doesn't take any risk, really. Um, a green dot is when someone chooses to pull someone aside and check in on them. Right? Uh, come to the bathroom with me. Are you okay? It seems like you've had a lot to drink. I'm worried about you going home. Right? 
Um, so we always, right, we hear these conversations like, oh, make sure you grab your friend's keys, right? Like we wouldn't want our friend to drive home if they're intoxicated, but we also need to think about who they may or may not be going home with, right? And we're not saying that people can't go out and have a good time, be adults, do things that people do when they leave parties with someone else, but we do need to be mindful of whether or not that person can actually like appropriately make that decision for themselves, right? Um, it's giving someone a ride home. It's telling someone to back off. It's calling the police, right? It's sharing your concern with somebody who has influence or power in a situation. Um, it's letting a bartender know that there might be something that's high risk going on, right? A lot of bartenders nowadays receive training in these kinds of things. They're not always great, um, but more and more conversations are taking place, right? So you probably have um, advocates or people who have your back in any given public situation. It's just that we all stay quiet about it, right? All right, and so just how Facebook spread, we can reduce um, these types of violence on our campus by spreading reactive green dots. In fact, the only way that the violence will be reduced is when our green dots start to outnumber the red dots. Make sense? Cool, so that's how we shift a culture, right? In a visual way, we're turning it from red to green, right? We're going from harm um, to intervention, right? And there's even another step, but we'll get to that later. All right, so no one's gonna ask you to suddenly drop out of school, right? To um, go be a revolutionary activist and save the world, right? Um, if that were a thing that I could do, that's what I would be doing for a living, right? Um, we're also not gonna ask you to change your program, right? Like we're not gonna ask you to do these big um, fundamental shifts in who you are, right? Because everybody at every stage of who we are, how we interact with the world, we can all do something, all right? Uh, da -da -da -da. I think we're back to you. So it would be wicked cool, again, showing my age, sorry about that, um, if there was just something we could do, like a slogan or a campaign, a campaign that said, go do green dots, and people did them, and we ended violence. But it's hard. It doesn't just go away. We have to look at that culture and figure out why people are intervening. It's hard to do green dots. It's hard, right? There are things that get in our way. And those things are called barriers. Barriers are those obstacles that create a barrier for us that don't, where we can't get involved. It could be, and it can feel overwhelming, like a wall, like we're in a box, like we see something and we know something bad is happening, but we don't know what to do. Um, and those are barriers. And when we talk to individuals about why they don't engage, it's because of barriers. There's three different types of barriers that we encounter. There's personal barriers. There's something about you, your personality, your experience that causes you not to be able to engage in that moment. It could be um, fear. It could be unsure, not wanting to make a scene. You could be introverted. You could not really know what you're seeing. They could be relationship or social barriers. For instance, not wanting to break an unspoken rule in your group, being perceived as a squeaky reel. You know, we all have that one friend in the group who's a Hermione Granger, who's, like, who's always a rule follower, who's always calling attention to something. You know, there's always that person, the party police. There's always someone. Maybe you don't want to be that, and that's not the role you feel like you can play. And then there's also organizational barriers. So if in our workplace, in school, um, if we're in a clinic or a hospital, you know, maybe the person engaging in those red dot behaviors is a supervisor one of the doctors you work with, a department chair. That could be a real barrier. Maybe there's some unwritten rule or expectation, I'm the new person and everyone else seems to be going along with this and I'm not going to. So these are real barriers for us. Um, and they're real. And sometimes we're aware of them and sometimes we're not. Again, I'm the Title IX coordinator, so violence prevention is my job. Uh, and at the institution, Based on the authority of my position, I don't have a lot of barriers. I can talk to Richard, I can talk to students, I talk to security, I talk to faculty, staff, even the president, and I tell them what needs to happen and then it happens, right? Because I don't have a lot that gets in the way because I have the law, I have policy, I have practice, I have training, um, but I'm not here all the time. I have a life separate, I'm Ben and Jeffrey's mom. 
I'm Greg's wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a PTO president, I volunteer, I'm just the woman in the library sometimes. So I have this outside life and my barriers are real there. Um, I, again, I've been doing this work for a long time. I have four younger brothers, we're all in our 40s now so we're not the kids anymore. Um, close family, but you know, I had this one brother next in age to me and we kind of butt heads just like siblings do. We're close, I'm gonna see him this weekend, I'm pretty excited about that. But he, of the four, five of us was the drama queen of the group. Like there was always some drama with his relationships, there was always something going on for him, it was always a victim of someone else's problem. You know, he just, and so he just always used to butt heads with me. I would not listen to him all the time. And he was always having relationship issues, some of them orchestrated by himself, you know. And there was one time I came home and he was home. I didn't live there, none of us lived there except for my youngest brother and I couldn't figure out why he was there. And I said, and he had a black eye. I said, what you doing here? He's like, I moved out. He would have been living with his long-term girlfriend. I said, how come? And he said, because Christine and I had a fight. And he wouldn't look at me. I said, does your face have anything to do with what happened with that fight? He goes, yeah. Now my brother is almost 200 pounds. He's much taller, he's a big, and he, but he is one of those gentle giants, never heard a fly. His girlfriend beat the crap out of him. And had they been having relationship issues, maybe? Had I seen it? No. Had I helped him when they were having fights, when I knew something probably was going on? No. Because my barriers were, that's just Adam. Am I proud of that? No, this is, my, this is what I do. Should I have seen it? Maybe, but my barriers were there. What I can say is I was there for him. I believed him, I got him connected. How can I help you? What do you need from me? This is not your fault. When other people in the family gave him a hard time about it and so told him he should take her back or move back in, I stood up for him, so I was there for him. So I can feel good about that, but I don't feel good about not seeing what happened. Barriers are real, we all have them. We're not bad people because of our barriers. But we need to recognize that there are sometimes barriers are there because of millions of years of evolution, because you know that sometimes we're fearful of our safety and we should listen to that voice. Because to be a good bystander, an active bystander, does not mean you should put yourself in harm's way either, right? So we should listen to those barriers. But one of the things that's important to understand is that our barriers are not going to disappear, but there's lots of times when they're not walls. They're really just small obstacles that we can find other ways to work around. Maybe we're not directly engaged in something, but we can find other tools to help a situation. Can you switch this oh, you did already, awesome. So in the green dot strategy, we look at that, and there's some other teaching tools out there too that look at the same model. It's called the three Ds, direct, distract, delegate. Um, and these are helpful tools to think about ways to get around your barriers and your obstacles to, to intervening. Direct, do something yourself. Go up to someone and say, you know, I think you've had a lot to drink. Can I get, call you a cab? Or I feel really uncomfortable with what you're doing. I, I, I feel better if you stopped or do you have friends that I can connect you to? Because um, I don't think this person's ready to go home with you. It could be delegate. Again, I'm an introvert. I don't like to talk to people. It's totally outside my comfort zone with strangers. But I have a friend. Annette, she'll talk to anybody, she's loud, she's in your face, and she has no shame. And so if I'm uncomfortable with the situation, I say, hey, Annette, will you go talk to that person over there? I'm a little worried about what I see. And she says, oh yeah, she has no idea what I need her to do. She just goes over and starts herself and tries to get involved. Sometimes delegating means you talk to the bouncer, say, I'm worried about this, or you talk to an advisor, or your clinical supervisor, or your nurse supervisor. You let someone else know who you believe has the authority and the ability to maybe do something. All right, sometimes it's faculty members, sometimes security. For those students who live on campus, they often go to their RAs. And then the last D is distract. This is when you create some sort of interruption to the activity. I work with students all the time. We talk about the biggest distraction tool ever. Come look at this. I want you to see this really crazy cat video on my phone, or you text someone, or you call them, and you interrupt what's happening. Um, I had a student once who, um, I worked at a land-grant institution with fraternities and sororities, which shall remain unnamed, and there was a freshman pledge who was seeing something he felt really uncomfortable with, with one of the seniors in the fraternity, but didn't feel like he had the political and social cachet to be able to do anything, but was really uncomfortable, so we went up to the guy and said, 
dude, don't you drive a blue Ford pickup truck? And he's like, yeah, the cops are towing it. And so the guy went and took care of his car or went to go check on his car and the woman's friends got her out of that situation. I have students who are always the designated driver who drink water but sometimes tend to be really sick and get someone to go to the bathroom with them. Or they, so there's all kinds of different ways we can distract. When I work with college students, that's their favorite. Um, when they're in a social setting or outside in the world, delegate, follow closely by delegate because it's nice to have someone else go in and champion that for you. Can you all think of examples of any of these things that you've done or you might do? Maybe in the classroom? Anything? I think pretending to know someone is just really helpful, particularly in a social setting, at a bar, at a party, yep. just really just going right up to the person that seems to be a potential victim. And that can carry you pretty far for a while. No, absolutely, I love that one. Pretend to be someone's new best friend. And, you, and usually they'll play along or they're too intoxicated or altered to be able to do something about that. Other strategies people have used in the past or have seen other people use that worked. So like if we have a patient who has an abusive spouse, we try to distract them by like saying we have like a ton of paperwork they have to do so that we can talk to the one, the person. We're gonna see that scenario in just a moment. So we know some of these things already. We have a lot in our toolkit all that we've already done. Um, so it doesn't matter which green dot you choose to do. It just matters that you do. Here, we'll use yours, because they're prettier. Now, here in Portland, we have people sitting at tables, and I'm not sure what it looks like in Biddeford. But I'm just going to ask, we're going to do a little activity. So maybe the three of you could be partners. And maybe this table can work together. Oh, you got a couple. You got a lot of people at this table. So you guys can do, be two teams. I don't know if you folks want to work together. Go. And you all can either work together or jump on a table. So, thank you. So, it's all fine and good for me to talk about these different ways of getting out of um, red dot situations, ways to practice the 3Ds, but it's much more effective if you talk about them and um, can practice what we're talking about. So. What Richard and I have prepared, we have four different scenarios that we're going to show you. And in that scenario, once I read it, I'm going to ask you to come up with either a distract, a delegate, or a direct D that you can do to diffuse that situation. And then if you could write it in the quadrant that pertains to that slide, I have scenario one, two, three, and four. So just take a second in your little group, and then we'll just do a quick report back. It's not super complicated. So. I'm going to read the scenario, give you a D to engage in, and then you're going to brainstorm some different ways you might do that. Make sense? This is yes? All right. All right, scenario one. At a party, someone looks really drunk, and he or she is being led to a bedroom away from the group. So why don't we do a distraction D for this one? So think about all the different ways you might practice a green dot that might be fall into the distraction category. Maybe write them down in that quadrant. So y'all, did you folks were able to come up with some ideas? All right, how about this table? Can you give me, you got two teams here. How about this team give me couple, one thing you came up with? Uh, oh, sorry. And we have a microphone. Hello. Okay. We said that you, uh, you could go up to her and say, your friend needs help or that your friends are leaving. Okay, so that's a delegate. Oh, awesome. Okay. Or distraction, yes. Or you could do it from a distraction point too because they're leaving without you, right? Awesome. How about this table? Pull the fire alarm. Pull the fire alarm. That's like the default distraction and, I, and my law enforcement people, friends, often discourage that, but if, if it's a last ditch, if it's the last thing in your toolbox, I'm not gonna say no, but sometimes that causes other problems. 
um, so, um, but no, with some sort of distractions, car alarms are great, you know, or something. Car alarm. So we do maybe one more over here. What'd you guys come up with? Um, we just said, um, you run up to them and be like, I think somebody took your keys or your wallet or something. Stole your keys or your wallet. No one wants their wallet stolen. I don't want my wallet stolen. Okay, let's do another one. All right. You notice, because this never happens, you notice a couple in the parking lot arguing loudly. He grabs her by the arm aggressively, and you are getting concerned about rapid escalation. So let's do this one from the direct standpoint. So where you're going to say or do something with a person potentially doing the red dot. So take 60 seconds in your same, same teams. So you're going to directly engage with the person who's causing the red dot behavior. Did you guys come up with something? Yeah. OK. Well, I would say. Okay. Uh, I would probably just walk up to the couple and tell them she doesn't stop, and I'm going to call 911. Okay. So she would go up to the couple, because that feels comfortable for her, and say, if you don't stop this, I'm going to call 911. One over here. We actually have a live tweet response. Awesome. Um, this answer is threaten to call cops or security. Let the person know you've done that. Um, hopefully they leave and you can avoid any problems. Awesome. And that's from Biddeford? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Biddeford. Um, the group over here that didn't go last time. What did you come up with? Very similar to everyone else, but we said to walk up and ask, you know, like what's going on, kind of intervene a little bit. Anyone else have one? One of these groups? Okay. When we talk about distractions, this is another one with a group. All of a sudden, you become this person's best friend. You, oh, hi, Sally. I haven't seen you in like 20 years. I'm so glad to see you. And then you can sometimes shift the continuum. Let's do another one, Richard. This one might be more pertinent to either your internship, externship, um, work setting. And I think one of the tables over here came up with the scenario, or had this scenario. Because this happens. You're in a clinical setting, and you have a patient's partner who always attends his appointments and doesn't seem to let your patient speak for himself or to make decisions in response to your questions. And there's some other, maybe some concerning things you're worried about, but you don't feel like you can talk to the patient about. So think about maybe direct to the person who is being harmed. So your patient. How would you interact with your patient about it? So what strategies do people come up with, if, either a direct or some other strategy, if you felt something that would work better than a direct approach? All right. You can address the um, abuser, however you want to term it, as saying it's a, our policy to interview or speak to the patient without anyone in the room, and we'll come get you when we need to. So fall back on policy, which may or may not be accurate, but that's a, a technique. Anyone else? We're here. Earlier, they distracted by giving them lots of paperwork to go do, right? They're like, yes, paperwork. Other things. This table, did you come up with anything? OK. So separate them. All right. We are going to move on, I think in interest of time, so uh, as you were. Hello. There we go. So I had mentioned um, that these are all reactive green dots, um, and there's another type. They're proactive, right? So things that we can do well before um, someone is um, experiencing harm or somebody else is perpetrating harm, right? So if we think back to the image of our map, right, uh, you'll notice that um, the red dots and the reactive green dots are done in response to something, right? Um, but we'll actually notice is that most of the map is still wide open. It's very empty, right? Um, for as many red dots as there are, um, a reactive green dot is only going to occur, right? If somebody sees it, and so at best they can only really be equal. Um, so what we can do is fill the map with a bunch of proactive green dots, right? Um, what that does is fill up all this space um, and set a culture, right? Um, it doesn't allow the red dots really any room on the map. If we start filling it with more and more green dots and we're changing that culture, right, um, 
people aren't as likely to perform a red dot, right? To perform some sort of act that harms someone else, okay? Uh, so that unclaimed space is open to be filled with anything that comes along. If we don't fill it with green dots, it will be filled with red dots. People will take advantage of the opportunity. Um, so proactive green dots are designed to fill that space. And they may include things like um, wearing a green dot pin, right? Or wearing some sort of visual marker um, that says um, that you don't tolerate red dots. That, you know, power-based personal violence is not welcome in front of you or around you. Um, it doesn't have to be a particular thing. It can be um, something from another advocacy or service organization. Um, you can post something on the Facebook account or other social media that you have, right? Um, something besides cat videos, recipes, um, news articles about how the world is or is not going to your favor, right? Um, you can like things, you can share, you can comment, you can engage with um, conversations online, right? Um, you can also ask a professor, um, you can ask a student organization presenter or um, president, um, we can come in and have this conversation with particular classes. We can have a full training with your student organization. Um, we can do this lecture, um, this overview, and then some, right? If there's things that you really want to dig into, that's available. Um, do, 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 do. Um, just have a conversation with your friends. Let them know what you learned about today. Let them know that like this is something that exists at the university, that this initiative will be growing, um, and we're looking for more people always to help carry out this type of work. Um, retell a cool story, um, right? If you heard an example today that you were like, oh, that's pretty funny, right? Or if you see something in the news, reshare it. Let people know that it's like, it's not as socially awkward to step up and stop violence as people think it is. Um, often it's easier than you think, especially if we use these little distractions, right? At the end of the day, like everyone's safe, nobody's to blame, and you all get to maintain your reputations, right? That's really what people are worried about um, when it comes to bystanders, right? It's why we don't step in, because we have all this social anxiety usually, right? Um, you can, if you have um, a space that you primarily work in, right, um, whether it's a classroom, um, whether you have your own like specific cubicle um, or your own little like landing station um, or whatever it is, um, if it's in a clinical setting now or in the future, right, put something up that says like, it's okay to talk to me about this stuff, right? I'm going to help you, like I'm going to be there with you. Um, when somebody says or does something um, that is a green dot, right, affirm it. Let them know that you saw it, right? Like, I see you doing good work over there, good job, right? Um, like, thank you, that was a good thing, right? Um, people need, we need that affirmation. We need to know when we do something good that it is good, right? Um, participate in class discussions, participate in social conversations, just keep the conversation alive, all right? So, your list of proactive green dots should clearly answer the question, right? If a new student came to UNE, um, through a social organization, through um, a class, through a friend group, how would they know that violence is not tolerated here and that everyone is expected to do their part, right? So when we can answer that, then um, we've started to change our culture. I'll just ask for some examples. All right, uh, so if you have to leave, totally fine, right? Um, I think I can't really stop all of you at once. I'm a small guy, right? Thank you all for coming. Um, if you do, um, please make sure to fill out your attendance card and leave it either in one of the uh, up front or with some folks in the back, okay? Thank you. Um, for those of you who are able to stay, um, can anyone provide an example of a proactive green dot that you could do in a space here on campus, right? Um, so we've got some photos, right? Um, you know, are you in Finley? Are you in Alexander grabbing some food? Are you in a classroom? Are you in a clinical setting? What are some things that you could do proactively to let people know um, that violence is not okay here? I know, the pool of like people to hide in got a lot smaller, sorry. I, I guess you can go with the, I guess the phrase, like see something, do something. Okay, so other than our spaces, what about 
Um, with electronics, with your personal social media, are there things you can do? The answer is yes. But what kinds of things can you do? Similar, like you said, you can share a story of someone, like the general, the off, the off-duty police people from Sweden who took down that guy in the subway or whatnot. And they, there was a woman just recently who had to step in for someone who was being insensitive to another writer. So sharing those type of stories and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Anyone else? Um, I think another was, um, I guess, after the election. A lot of people posted on their um, Facebook that um, and um, allied so that others, like you know, your friends and others, can know that you know you're there for them. Yeah, let people know how you feel. Let people know what your values are. Right? Um, it's your social media account for one. Right? Um, some other things you can do. You can put something small at the end of your email signature. Um, if you're using social media, um, there is a UNE Green Dot page um, on Facebook for the, uh, for the university program um, where we share different um, resources, different events going on, different articles and perspectives. Um, cool. What about in conversations? What are realistic ways that you could use a conversation to show your support for this issue? I guess it's not really like in support, but I think um, if you overhear something or you hear somebody um, using derogatory language or um, being verbally aggressive to somebody, I think saying like there's that this is not the place for that kind of conversation or that language and it's not okay what you're doing. Thank you. All right, so. Yes, you can. Um, one of the things I love about Green Dot is that it's called Green Dot and not like violence prevention. Because what happens is I go in to pick up t-shirts for an event and the t-shirt person says, what is this Green Dot thing? And then the next thing I know, I spent 10 minutes talking to her about violence prevention and she's all right there with me or the mail carrier's all right there with me because he's like, people don't have barriers to Green Dots. They may have assumptions about great mythology and violence, but when you talk to them about Green Dots and Red Dots, you've already like converted them before they've realize what you're talking about. So I like it because it breaks down barriers before they even realize they have them, so. All right, so between our reactive green dots, right, um, our three Ds, our strategies to prevent red dots, and with our proactive green dots, there's something that everybody in this room can do. There's something that everybody on campus can do, right? Um, both campuses, hey, bit of a, right? Like there's something that all of us can do, big or small, okay? So it's not necessarily about what you do, right? Um, the important part is that you do something, right? Um, one of the taglines for Green Dot is, nobody has to do everything, right? But everybody has to do something, right? Um, we all can and should do even the smallest thing because that is what adds up to a culture change, right? It's really easy to start a Facebook account, right? None of us were like, I'm gonna log in and I'm gonna engage in this sort of technological revolution. Like, we just did it, right? Um, similarly, you can just do these things, right? It doesn't have to be this whole, like, save the world thing every time. If you wanna save the world, come talk to me, right? Um, these little things all add up, though. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, so when Mark Zuckerberg first created Facebook, quirky little thing, right? Um, but we all, like, even if we didn't use it, right, um, we're part of a generational shift. We were part of one of the largest cultural changes in America in decades, right? Um, and something that's taken control of the whole planet, right? Now, imagine if we could do something just as simple, right, but that saves people from harm, that keeps people from experiencing trauma, that keeps people safe and respects human dignity, right? Um, we can do all of that through small little things just like creating a Facebook account, okay? So, um, this can't necessarily end, right? Like, now that it's time up, it's time to go, right? This can't just end because the, the, the session is over. Um, so we have to do something with it. Um, is there anybody who can think of a proactive green dot that you can do today? Like, before you go to bed, what's something that you can do?
yeah, you can tell a friend um, that this happened, right? That this program exists at the university, that there are people they can go and talk to if they want to learn more information. Um, I think because social media is so pervasive, even just tweeting the link to you know, your organization's page would be really helpful as well. UNE.edu slash title hyphen nine, right? You can send that to folks, right? Like, you could just like go snag the green dot image off, you know, the website, throw it up on Instagram, and people are like, what is this random thing? Like, is your phone broken? No, it's a whole bystander prevention initiative, right? Like, there's, there's ways to do this, okay? Anyone else, something that you think you can do today? This may be a little bit corny, but Michael Jackson, man in the mirror, before you go to bed, start mm. with yourself. Very much, thank you. Um, is there more to wrap up? Is there more to wrap up? That concludes most of our conversation around Green Dot. Again, this is an overview. If you're interested in learning more, finding out how you can do more with this program, either as an individual, with your class, with your colleagues, with your college, you can contact myself, you can contact Richard, Carolyn on the other campus. We serve both campuses of the university. We are, there's about 20 instructors, and I know I'm working on this campus with Ray and Leah to pick two Saturday mornings in June for those students who are around this summer. I know we're planning this afternoon our curriculum and our calendar for next year for the university, but if there is a need or an interest earlier, we're able to do that. We also are doing a bunch of these one-hour one-off speeches as well. So um, we're very engaged, we're very excited, we're very hopeful. The students we're working with are super excited. Um, and if you have ever met Anne Laflamme, who's a security officer, she will talk to you about Green Dot the whole time she's driving around campus. Because she believes in the message and she can see how it translates to making changes in our community. So I'd like to thank IPEC and thank Carolyn for spotting us on the other campus. And again, um, my office on this campus and. Portland is in 102 McDougall Hall. When I'm in Biddeford, I'm in 129 DeCary Hall, and Richard serves both campuses as well, so you can find him in 02 Proctor and in the Campus Center, right? Yeah. So anything else you want to add? So thank you, I know you all. I'll stick around if people have questions, um, and I think Carolyn can do the same on the other campus if people have questions or are interested, and if you want to get involved in a training, you can shoot me an email or give me your name today. <laughs>